switch to kind of stay with the, uh, the analog to actual functions. So we've got a copy of graph, another copy of graph, and then a vertical line between each, uh, each vertex. Okay. So what we're going to do, this is just you know, construction. What we're going to do, we're going to do this uh, independent bond edge percolation, fancy term, but it means that we're just going to flip a coin for each of them, and then we're going to uh, uh, remove it, say, if, uh, if the coin comes up heads. Um, so I say it's a slightly more general random model in that in this, we're not going to require that each coin is the same weighting. In particular, we say that all, all we care about is that this edge has the same weighting as this edge, this edge has the same weighting as this edge, and this edge has the same weighting as this edge. So as long as both of the copies of G kind of have the same weights, then you know, this is what we can do. Uh, and there are, there are even more general formulations of it where you know, it's not known one way or the other, but it's, it's unclear if our proof technique could actually be generalized to this. Okay. So, so we've, we've done this modification of the graph. We've flipped coins, we've removed edges, and now we're going to say that we want to pick two vertices. So, so back to our picture, pick any two vertices, maybe we pick maybe we pick two and three. We want to say that two is at least as likely to be connected to three as two is to be connected to three prime. So kind of, this, this, this seems very intuitive because in all notions of like paths between two and three, you can always find, like, like it, it's, it's, it's shorter in pretty much any, you know, any, any sensible way you can think of that two is closer to three than it is to three prime, right? Take any path, it's going to be a little bit longer to get to three prime, and so you're giving yourself more chances for, uh, for your coins to have come up and broken that path. So you're giving the same way, equal weights to all of the horizontal? Um, for ours, we're actually going to be fixing only two of them anywhere in the graph, any two vertical edges stay. So uh, in, the, in the statement of the conjecture, it's the same way to each of them. But for us, we're going to say, oh, any two of them stay. And we're going to say, for sure, those stay. And well, if one or two of them didn't, then it already falls into some cases that we're known before. So if, if none of them stay, then definitely it's true. If one of them stays, then it's uh, an <coughs> application of that PG. Okay. So originally in 1985, and in its current form, the, where we have, you know, kind of, it, was, it was kind of a very nascent conjecture there. Okay, so if only one vertical edge, FKG, and that's because uh, saying that edges are definitely going to happen on one side, the main, those two things are definitely connected on one side, is a monotone property, and so it kind of falls nicely into this uh, class of correlation inequalities. Um, so there are some things here where, like, it actually depends. Some some more recent partial results are dependent on the structure of G and less about like what vertical edges are available. So outer planar, this one it works works out through some. They generalize it to a column on hypergraphs. They get some partial results there and say, oh, it comes back. If, if G is actually outer planar, then then we have the conjecture is true. And this one's even more restricted that this probability that we keep an edge has to be pretty high. Okay. And so what we're going to do, we're going to take, you know, this first one was actually with the, the statement by, uh, by uh, Hagstrom in 1998, he mentions this first one, where it's just you know, one paragraph proof about using FKG inequality. So what we're going to do is we're going to be able to extend that to two vertical edges. So here's just a very sketchy sketch of, uh, of our Way we're going to do it, and what we're going to do is instead of looking at like individual edges in it, we're going to abstract out a little bit and only look at you know probabilities that things are connected with either side. And we're going to be using FKG to say if they're positively correlated. But kind of the, the point where it it uh, it breaks with just being able to use that and get your answer is that uh, the ways that E can be connected to V1 and V2, right? It could be that E is connected to both V1 and V2 in your left copy of the graph. So it could be like, imagine it's just a bunch of vertices, it didn't show it for, for clarity. But it could be that you know, there's some path from some vertex here, the, your, your S, up to both the V1 and also on the side up to V2. So in that case, the thing you're conditioning on are connection, uh, connection events in the left graph. So it should definitely be positive, positively correlated with some other connection thing happening in the left graph. 
But the complication happens is that let's say or let's say we've got these two vertices here, one like one that's uh, the two vertices with vertical edges. It could be that your S is connected to one of them in the left, and then it happens in the right hand side that the two vertices connect to each other. That's also what like that that, that could also be a way in which S is connected to both D1 and D2. Sorry, could you say that example? Okay. More slowly. Yeah. So so we've got S, V1, V2, okay? We want to say that S is connected to V1 and V2. Right? This is the thing we're going to be conditioning on. Well, it could be that S is connected to V1, and then V1 has a vertical edge. So we look at V1 prime, the thing over here on like, the prime to copy the graph. That V1 prime is then connected to V2 prime, okay? Now, if we condition on this, then we've suddenly said, oh, we're having something on the right-hand side be connected to each other. We don't necessarily have this correlation stuff that we want going on, because it could be that V1 being connected to V2, V1 prime being connected to V2 prime makes it very likely for V1 prime or V2 prime to be connected to uh, F, uh, F prime. Okay, so we need to kind of balance that, like, how, how those are correlated with the likelihood, or with the way that V1 and V2 being connected, so like being connected in the left copy, would improve our likelihood to be connected to F on the left copy. So this is what, we, it goes through a lot of details and kind of left it off and left it as a sketch here, but that, that balancing of the probabilities is really what we're doing here. Okay, and I think a really interesting thing for this, like going forward, and you know, this is like very recently that you know saw this, so definitely not like not 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 entirely settled yet. Would be to try and find a way of saying, well, I want to have exactly k vertical edges. Is there some way of having the computer maybe like use these inequalities that we know from correlation inequalities, expand things out with you know inclusion exclusion, and you know pair off the probabilities? Say, oh, it has to be greater than we're connected to the left. Than so I think the conjecture. So the conjecture is that we have these two vertices picked in G. So S and F are in G, and we want to start and finish. Yeah, start and finish. Uh, and we want to say that S is more likely to be copy, more likely to be connected to the copy of finish that's in its own copy of G than it is to be connected to the finish in the other copy. Any other questions on this? So I think then we'll go on to our last topic, which is kind of a little bit on, more on the numeric side of things than, uh, than the experimental trying to get the computer to prove something side of things. Um, and this is uh, problem in rational catalog theory. So we've got these dig pads, and unlike in the you know, case of catalog numbers where this, path, this line that we have to stay below is slope one, we're going to allow some other rational slope to show up. So in particular, uh, it's like a, b, n, it's going to be slope a over b. And um, we're going to be looking at this as the growth in n happens. So really, we could you know, have combined n in and said we want a, n, b, n dig pads. But we kind of leave it, leave it separately just so that it's clear that that's the thing that's going uh, to be increasing. We want to see how does this behave as we increase n. Okay. So this is kind of a more formal way of describing it, but really you can just think about it as like, how many of these walks through this lattice can you have that stay on or below? So it could hit, I guess it doesn't here, but maybe it could come up like that and hit and then keep going. So, uh, some stuff by Duchamp here where he relates it to a uh, certain grammar that he places on uh, you know, a, a language, so, so good, good comment to works on words showing up here in Duchamp's paper. And he's able to show, well, up to, like, up to a constant what the growth rate is as n increases. And I guess I should also mention in the case that uh, in here, if, if, like, if this a and b n were co-prime, so it's kind of the n equals 1 case, but uh, there is well, there's a very nice formula. In this, and for this problem, as n grows, it's going to be growing like this. Okay. And kind of more explicitly what the bounds are. So um, it's going to be between uh, this on the low end, this on the high end. So we, we don't really know what the constant is, but we know that it's somewhere between 1 over a plus b and 1 over a. Right, the constant for this uh, growth. 
Okay, so I think this is kind of a really cool proof. Uh, I just want to highlight it, it's not going to take long, but um, the getting this upper bound, Slight, slightly weaker upper bound than you know, what Duchamp had, but it, you, know, you define an equivalence relation, which is this notion of conjugation, which is you can imagine like you're rotating your uh, word, where a word is you know, either a step to the right or a step up. So for example, here it's right, right, up, right, 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 up, up, right, right, up, right. So imagine, are we taking a step to the right, or are we taking a step up as we finish off? So on, on like describing the path as this word, you make conjugacy classes by, or you make equivalence classes by um, uh, conjugating. Um, and so you can, you can show that only one of these can happen, because let's say you have a valid dig path, and then you rotate some number of steps. Well, that means that some like so maybe this is your path like that, and you rotate. Well, this here is where you're rotating R. Then you're definitely going to have this part of the path. Your W two is a slope that's higher than like than the slope of the line. So by bringing this to the beginning, you have to necessarily be going above the line. And I, I don't know, I thought this was really cool. And a similar thing to this looks like it could work for a generalization layer. So uh, just want to mention this. Okay. So uh, there are some other special cases where we know it. I guess, the, but I should say, the, the reason we're mentioning this, what we're doing in terms of numerics, is to try and generate a lot of dick paths through like, increasingly complicated ways. In particular, there's one using generating functions where you're able to generate just in like the, the, like very very far along this sequence, we're able to figure out what uh, what the number of dig paths is, um, and then we're going to be trying to you know tease out some information about how this grows, like what the constant is. Okay, so um, yeah, so some other special cases we got it if, uh, if a equals one, then we got it exactly. Not even you know, worry about what the constant is. We have an exact formula for it. Um, and also here we have an exact formula for any ABN, but the downside is is that it's you know not a very like practical to use exact formula. Right, we're summing over all of these uh, these sets of integers that satisfy this condition. It's, it's, it's easy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's easy. It's easy to describe it when you allow yourself all the tools you want to describe it. Okay, so. This is kind of one of the first uh, approaches for getting a lot of data, dynamic programming te technique, where you say, uh, as you're going up, well, the number of paths to here is you know, the number of paths to, to this one step below plus the number of paths to one step to the left. So get that, get a lot of data. Um, I guess I should mention we also have a technique of generating functions to get even more, more quickly. Um, once we get a lot, we're able to do a statistical fit, get some estimate for what the coefficients are, and also, in, in, well, only in the cases of uh, uh, two thirds and three, uh, and sorry, for three halves and five halves, were we able to find uh, recurrences? And there's conjectural recurrences. It seems to fit this recurrence, and as we you know, keep increasing it, it just keeps fitting it. Like it keeps keeps agreeing with what the recurrence would say we should have. So, some good conjectures there. But uh, in terms of approximating the constants, we get some data. It's kind of nice. Okay, this is kind of a, a, a more interesting generalization, I think, in that we, uh, so, so we're going to generalize it in this way. So before we had just that, you know, x a was less than b y, say, but now we're adding a third dimension in, and yeah, if we allow some zeros, then it just reduces down. Uh, it's only one case I was able to find, so hunting around, you know, putting sequences into OAS, this is the only one that I was able to see that, you know, already very well studied uh, was if a equals b equals c equals 1. So it has this very beautiful formula, generalization of Catalan numbers. So, yeah, so before we were concerned with the constant is, but we always knew the, the uh, exponent was 1 over n in the two-dimensional case. Well, now we have one data point where we see, oh, it's 1 over n cubed. So maybe we like, might think, oh, probably it's going to be 1 over n cubed right, for all the other a, b, and c. Um, however, this, this 1 over n cubed actually just you know, empirically appears to be quite different. So, we have a statistical model where we you know, keep the exponential part the same, and we have 1 over n to the alpha. And so we get these coefficients for this. this. So as, as we increase one of the parameters, it becomes you know, 
much, you know, grow, grows much more quickly than one of a grand cube, or increases a different one, grows much more slowly than one of a grand cube. These are the exponents? Yeah, these are the exponents. So, these are the alphas if there's one over any of the alpha. So, uh, we can see a lot, like something very different is happening than in the two dimensional case where all we were changing were the coefficients, now we're also changing kind of this, uh, the exponents of n. Okay, you cannot get two decimal points? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's unclear to say how much certainty, or certainty we have in this. So with this, we're generating out a lot of terms. We're getting some kind of statistical fit. We're seeing you know, what p-value, p like, what can we get from that p-value. And you can't really get that great from, from, the, from the Did you design. search the statistical literature on the ballot problem? Because that's um, what this is. Right? Yeah, I did the ballot problem. Yeah. 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 Um, I did. I saw some stuff for this 111 in phrase in terms of valve problems. Uh, yeah, it's has good valve problems as well. Oh, could you I go back to the, the data slide? Uh, so, uh, let's see. So, and this is there any, know. Is there any uh, understanding, like the, the three that's showing up in a few places? That just, yeah, I think it might just be. Do you the, think it might actually be three? I don't see any good indication for why it would actually be three. I think it's some number that's near three. Yeah. Okay, and then the last thing that we considered, kind of keep it out of time. The last thing we considered in terms of these, you know, gathering data to, you know, see what what might be an interesting pattern for future work in rational slope paths is this uh, counting time above the line. So before, we were always re requiring that we stay below this certain slope line. Now we're going to say if we have exactly you know, k steps that ended up above the line, what, uh, what, what can we say about the number of paths like that? So um, let's see. This is in the uh, slope one case. Anderson has this result. It's called the arc sine result because as it goes to infinity, you get this thing that when you integrate it, you get arc sine. Okay. So one, one thing to note to notice with this is that it blows up when k is near n and when k is near uh, uh, when k is near zero. And so no, your continuous case is due to Levy. In okay. this case is due to Spa Anderson. Okay. And his name is Spa Anderson. Right. Yeah. So just from you know this is this is for slope uh, two, 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 three, and we're able to get crazy high uh, counts of these things using generating functions. For slope uh, two, three, uh, we're looking at every uh, time that you're above by some uh, mod k. So this is saying you're above at least you know 200 steps uh, out of your uh, 400. Okay, very unlikely. So it looks. Empirically here, very much like the the Anderson result that you know your spikes at zero and one. More slowly zero to say, I don't understand the graph. What is this graph? So this graph is the number of. Uh, so what's the horizontal axis? Horizontal axis is the uh, like one fifth of how many times you are above the line. If you take n steps, so n is four hundred. If you're taking say two hundred steps that are above the line, and the other two hundred are below the line, it would be the middle. Here we're approaching almost all the steps are below the line, almost all the steps are above the line. Okay. And so we're counting like how many paths have that many steps above or below. Okay, so here in this 2, 3, we see it's very similar to the case uh, in slope 1. But notice here we were only looking at every fifth guy, right? There's a reason we didn't just say, oh, k is the number of steps above or below. We were looking at every fifth person, and we this has a very nice pattern. But suddenly we offset just by one. So instead of looking at every fifth, we look at every you know fifth plus four guy. Then suddenly it's very sloped just on terms terms of one side. And this is probably because there's multiple ways you can be crossing this rational slope thing. You could be crossing not just at a point where it hits the, like the lattice. You could be also crossing when it's like at like one fifth up a line on the lattice or two two fifths up a line on the lattice, that kind of thing. So this. Uh, how what what you are mod you know a plus b seems to be very important. Okay, that's it. Yeah, slightly past uh, five fifty. Thank you. Very much. Please enter the public part of the talk and the committee.